Hi, I'm Brian Anderson, and you're on Head On, and my guest tonight is George Lewis, a drum maker. Now, George, I guess I should say that we're on the traditional lands of the Sanaimu um, First Nation, yep. and you're from Nanaimo originally. Yeah, I'm from the Whites and the Wise family in Nanaimo. And then you've been in, you've been living in Campbell River for a number of years now. Yeah, just, just under 50 years. So how did you get started in making drums? I got started making drums through, through sweat lodge ceremony. And a man that I was attending sweat lodge ceremony with um, had been taught to make drums. And the interest had come up prior to that for me. You know, I, always, I wanted to make a drum, learn how to make a drum for quite a few years. And my friend Bill Garten that I was attending sweat lodge with offered to show me that art. So it's something that's been handed on from one to another. Yeah. It's not the sort of thing you can pick up on the internet? No. Now, during my original first teaching from Bill, that was one of the things that he really, really stressed the importance of, is that tradition being having been handed down for, for thousands of years, just in the way that he, he showed me. He never charged me. He wouldn't accept any payment for teaching me. And he said, you know, I'd, I'd like to see you give it freely at least, at least a few times so that the tradition is being handed down that way. So is that like a lot of the other First Nations uh, traditions? I've heard it said in, recently in a, quite a few drum workshops that I've done, people that are coming for the first time to make a drum, their elders really encourage them to give that first drum away. Oh, really? Yeah. That's and then they can keep the next one. Okay. Yeah. So take us through a little bit of the process uh, in making a drum. I take it it's not the easiest thing to do. No, there, you know, there are a couple of different angles of, of going at that. Um, for somebody that doesn't want to have as much involvement with the lab laborious part of it, you can order rawhide through places like Halford Hyde or International Hyde in Vancouver, and it's, it's pre-tooled, pre-stretched, prepared hide that you yeah. just need to soak and make a drum. But I've always, right from the very beginning, scraped all of my own hides, which means, you know, deherring, preparing the hide to go into, into a deherring barrel. Um, it's in the deherring barrel for four to seven days. You take it out of that barrel, put it over a beam and scrape all the hair off. Put that hide onto a stretcher, wait until it's stretched and dried, and then you get to cut the circle, punch the holes, and make the lace. So, Now, we've got one here, and when you're saying punch the holes, like if you, you can see at the back that there are holes in here, and so this is actually hide as well? Yeah, yeah. And I've cut that by hand with scissors. That particular drum required 25 feet of lace. Oh, 25 feet of lace. Yeah. And then is there a specific way that you tie all these together? Or yeah. As you can see, there, there are 16 holes all the way around the outside. There are actually 32. There are 16 sets of two holes. Okay. And once you've got those all strung, you start at one side, you go straight across the middle, and it actually you go back and forth until it looks like you've got a big star then all the way across the drum. Then those 16 strands are broken into four groups of four. So you, you come underneath after you've tightened everything all up, and you take your first, first group of four, put as many wraps as you're going to put on there, half hitch it at the furthest one over and then you move over to your next four strands and wrap them and you just go all the way around in so, that fashion until so they're all tied. I, so I take it part of the tying helps uh, tighten. Oh definitely, yeah. So does that add to the sound that the drum makes? Yeah, that's where the voice of the drum comes from is from the tightness or, or looseness of, of the hide. Because the 
I've been told that the drying of rawhide has the ability to almost move a mountain. There's really not much to, to really stop it once it starts to dry out. Um, that's where the voice of the drum comes from. When the, this rawhide starts to dry, you know, the drum is pulled, mm -hmm. tightened when the hide is completely wet. And it's when that hide, rawhide starts to dry, that's where the voice comes from. It tightens up. Now, as you say voice, uh, I'd say sound, but uh, mm -hmm. there's a different sound or voice with each different hide? Yeah, definitely. Um, what sort of hides do you use? I use just, just about any hide that comes to me. I, you know, I make bear hide drums. This one here is a sea lion, California sea lion hide drum. And this one over here that has the painting on it is a bear drum. So I make seal, seal drums, sea lion drums, bear drums, elk drums, moose drums, mm -hmm. buffalo drums. I've even made some cougar and wolf hide drums as well. Yeah, because there's a, a bison farm in Campbell River. Yeah, just down on Ham Road there. Yeah. So do you find it difficult getting hides, or is that something you have to plan for? No, you know, right from the start, the intention of that prayer that, that I wanted to, to be a drum maker and, and teach as many, that prayer started out um, having a desire to teach as many young, young kids as I could how to make a drum. And with the intention of that prayer, it wasn't, it really wasn't long at all before people that I didn't even know found out what I was doing and just started to bring hides. They'd show up in front of the house with their truck and offer me their deer hides or a bear hide or people would phone the house and say, oh geez, there's a dead seal down on the beach. So um, the hides just started to come to me. So is that sort of like a providence thing that, you know, or a karma that, you know, if you're good, good things will happen? I would think so, yeah. Like I say, it's, it's more, more a prayer of intention. You know, when, when you make that prayer and your intentions are clear, Creator provides what it is that, that you need. So, and I was teasing a little bit when I said the sound of the drum, but you actually feel that there's a voice in the drum. Now, does, so does the drum speak to you because it, uh, you make it, or somebody uses it in a drumming process? My answer to that question, Brian, would be a drum, a drum will speak to whoever's listening. You know, whether I make the drum for you or I make it for myself, you know, your intention to use a drum, however that use is, whether it's in a prayerful way or in a musical way, that drum, when I make it, when I make a drum for somebody, I think of that person and how their life might be. And um, that drum will speak to them and that's part of the teaching that I give when I teach people to make drums. If you're gonna take your drum home and hang it up on a wall, as a, a decorative thing, that's all it will ever be. But yeah. if you start to look after that drum and care for that drum the way it needs to be and you start to listen to that drum, that drum has the ability to take you places that you never imagined. So it can be on a very spiritual level? Extremely, yeah. A so, very personal level. So maybe more personal, say, than spiritual, but uh, everything means different things to different people. Mm -hmm. I would say it, for most, it probably starts out at a personal level and then at some point transpires into a, a spiritual level. So you mentioned that part of your whole background is dealing with First Nations people and your travel through life and things like that. Is that something you've picked up on the way or you've just come to learn? It's something you know, when I moved to Campbell River as a young boy, um, I was separated from that world. Um, you know, most of my time as a, as a young boy was spent on the number one reserve in Nanaimo here. And my, my family decided when I was 10 years of age to move to Campbell River and I ended up being removed from that whole world. 
And it wasn't until much later on in life, you know, as maybe in my late teen years that, that I started to reconnect with that, that part of my life, the native spirituality and, and that aspect of my life and become reconnected with it. And I'd have to say, I, it wasn't really a decision that was mine. It was just something within me that drew me back, back to it. It was something that was always there mm -hmm. in the background in my life and eventually drew me back. That's, so it was like a calling almost. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Now you mentioned before when we were talking that you do the drum making, but your wife has an involvement in that she's sort of the artist with some of the concept and... Oh, my beautiful wife, she, she sure does have an involvement and it's, I'd have to say it goes far, far, far beyond just the artwork. Um, my beautiful wife, Tina, has always supported, supported me to, you know, at 150% level in, in, in everything that I do. Mm -hmm. um, and so much with the drums. You know, I, I never, never dreamt I would find a woman that would put up, put up with some of the guckiness and the smell that comes from these things. But um, she supports me in, in so many different ways with the drum, other than just the art. But she is a world-class artist and um, she has the ability to create specific designs around different people's requests. So she, she also has a really big gift. Okay. Now you mentioned that uh, some of the designs, there are certain, certain things that are, I guess we would recognize as being typically First Nations. It's mm -hmm. not something that you see in other communities or groups or whatever. So, but I mean, some of these are very, you know, intricate and involved. Do they tell a story as well? I would say some of them do, and, and some of them simply come from the surroundings that, that we have, you know, eagle designs, bear designs. Yeah. Uh, a, lot of, lot of, a lot of our cultural stuff comes, emanates from, from our surroundings. This particular design, you can see the eagle. It's an eagle man with two heads. Yeah. And early on in my life of ceremony with the Lakota people, I was given that name during ceremony, Two Eagles. Um, they would say Wambli Numpa, meaning Two Eagles. And even before my wife, wife and I met, um, prior to our meeting, she was having dreams of an eagle man. And that's where this design comes from. And even within my family, um, my native family, there's, there are legends around uh, two-headed eagle man. Really? So that sort of takes you back again to... And I, found, I found that information out post having received my, my name from the Lakota people during ceremony. It was a ceremonial given name during a Uwipi ceremony. Now, I understand that you're also a dancer. Yes. Now, was that how you connected with the Lakota people? Yes. Through? Again, th again through sweat lodge ceremony and um, a lot of the people, I, even though I didn't, hadn't been told or didn't realize it at the time when I started going to sweat lodge ceremony, a lot of the people that I was going to sweat lodge with were, <laughs> were sun dancers. And there were a few of them that, I, that were attending Lodge that seen that in me, that, that I would eventually be a sun dancer. And they used to joke around about it quite a bit. So is sun dancer more a plains type of dance? Sun dance ceremony is, is a Lakota, Lakota ceremony. Okay. So how is that different than, say, Coast Salish or Sanaimu? I would have to say there, uh, even though there are stark differences, you know, definitely pertaining to the season. I know our coast, coastal people here dance most of the time during the winter. It's a winter dance here. Um, the eastern provinces, I think, you know, we're sun dancers and it's a summer ceremony. 
But there are so many things that could be referred to as much more than similarity. You know, the acknowledgement of the four directions is always there. The acknowledgement of the four races of, of two-leggeds, the black, the red, the yellow, and the white people. Um, there are so many things that are just too, too, too much to be referred to as similar anymore. Okay, so you find common trends sort of. Yeah in both cultures. Yeah. One of the things, now I understand like First Nations on the West Coast, there are four clans, like Raven, Eagle, or am I wrong there? No, I, I, I would believe there are, you know, quite a few different clans, you know, Killer Whale Clan, Wolf Clan, uh, Bear Clan. So is that sort of tied to your background or I guess it, it's hereditary then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know the eagle in, in my family, the eagle has always been really representative of our family. I can't honestly say that the eagle is our family crest because I don't know that for certain. Okay, so somewhere along the line, uh, you'd have to go to Ancestry or something yeah. to, to, to be able to tie something. I'd have to in. go to Auntie Colossal, which she would probably know. <laughs> <laughs> so. One of the other things, I guess, is that um, like there's been a lot of changes over time. Do you find sometimes that doing this sort of takes you, takes you back or takes you back into history? I would have to, my answer to that question would have to be pretty much anything cultural or traditional has that tendency to take people back back in history. So is that something that you enjoy or maybe respect, I guess it might be a better term, but. For me personally, anything ceremonial or traditional or cultural, those are all really good grounding tools for me. Um, helps me to keep centered in my life and more grounded. So one of the things that I should bring up before before uh, we get finished, uh, you do have a website. It's George Two Eagles Lewis, mm -hmm. and people can go to that. I know you've got a video that goes through the process of drum making and yeah. that sort of thing. But um, a lot of what you're doing, I think, is uh, don't you conduct classes at a lot of First Nations yeah. events? And yeah, a lot of the, the First Nations, you know, a lot of the bands hire me to, to go in and teach, teach their youth how to make drums. They do drum workshops for them. And more recently, tanning, tanning workshops where I tan, teach them how to tan skins into leather. And does that include the stretching? Yeah. Okay. It, it teaches everything right from the harvest of the animal, the skinning, the salting, yeah. right to a finished, finished pelt. So in a big part of that process, because I saw in the video that you had, there was, um, you were soaked the skins to make them more, I guess, more pliable so they would stretch. Yeah, that would be re-soaked um, because that would be post scraped, stretched and dried. Then you use your compass to compass out the right measurement of circle for whatever size of drum then everything needs to be re-soaked so it's pliable and, and stretchable again. So is that something, like making drums, is that something that's fairly easy for people to learn? It is, it really is. If, um, you know, all of my teachings around, around teaching people how to make drums, of course, comes from my Auntie Colossal with my Auntie Ellen White. You know, Auntie and I, had long conversations around me becoming a drum making instructor and the importance of the energy that I put into that and yeah. that that would be one of the things that I would teach the importance of anybody making a drum that they have good energy going on at that time because ultimately that's what they're putting into that drum. And I think that goes with a lot of things that other people say that if you're uh if you don't have a positive attitude, it shows in your work. 
Yeah. So if you've got a positive attitude or good energy, mm -hmm. then you're going to have or produce something that's better. Yeah. And I think it's not just necessarily the end product, it's the person as well. Yeah, that's right. Our, our Salish people have a reference for, for that energy. We call it our squallowans. We say put it, put your ice quallo and your your good energy into that, and and that same thing, that same teaching follows suit with not only the crafts that we're doing or other things. It's a really strict teaching, especially when it comes to cooking food, the cooking, of, the preparation of food when it's being served to others. I've, I've, I've witnessed the elders go right into the kitchen when they hear somebody in there cussing and just having a really bad time, they'll pull them right out of there and that's what they'll say, we don't want to eat your anger. You come out of there and let somebody else take over. So that could permeate into the food? Everything that you do, yeah. Mm, interesting. So personally, which do you derive greater pleasure from, making drums or dancing? Or does it depend? I would have to say part of my dance is making the drums. That's part of my life dance. So does that sort of get you into sync with the music, the drumming? The drumming. Personally, just for myself, I don't even really refer to it as music. Um, it's, it's the next step, the next stage in our ceremony even though there are fun songs that, that I can sing, some different things like that. A lot of the songs that I do sing are, are ceremonial or other okay. dancers' personal songs. So it's more the feeling of the drumming and the dance that sort of comes together? Mm -hmm. it's, it all integrates in, into one's life if, if you seek it. And that was one of the things that I was taught, one of the first things that I was taught at Sundance. Even though the ceremony is an eight-day ceremony, there are four days of purification and there are four days of dance. And the elder that that first took me under his wing and taught me for in the end for quite a few years, that was one of the things that he used to say continually. This isn't an eight-day ceremony. It's 365 and a quarter days. It's your life now. You live this way. So it's a, a whole pattern that you start and adopt? It's a way of life, yeah. Okay. And that's why the drums and, and the singing and the painting and so much, so many of the things that I do all integrate into one. So and that makes you, by being able to pass on drumming, do you feel that you're then recycling the skills and the energy? Yeah, passing it on, you know, I've heard so many elders make reference to, you know, the coming of the non-native people and after that the residential schools that so much of our culture was lost, you know, our language and, and mm -hmm. our ceremony was taken away for, for many years. And, you know, I've sought out different elders that, that don't necessarily agree with that. You know, they say the songs, the songs are never lost because of the nature of the songs. They're ceremonial songs. And when those Aishkwalawans, those good feelings and the good intent is put into the creation of that song, it never goes away. It's always there somewhere waiting, yeah. waiting for somebody to sing it again. And it's the same with the language. There's, there's always still someone who knows well, there's somebody that once said to me, or maybe I read it somewhere, that there are no real new quotes, that there's just things that are recycled, which I guess would be along the same lines you're talking about, that mm -hmm. it's out there, it's just a matter of, you they, know, somebody new will find they that They come energy. back in many, many, many different forms, too. I know, I know my beautiful wife has, has had dreams and I've been woken up by her speaking her own language. You know, saying words. I wake up to her saying new channelist words. And there's been a few times she's had to pick up the phone or phone her mom and find out what that word means or, or what it is. 
Oh, know? really? Yeah. So a lot of these, some of these things come back through dreams even. Sometimes they come back through casual conversation with a friend. It just spurs something in your mind. Uh, so you could rec sometimes recall things that may have happened when you were much younger, but yeah. are back in the recesses. Yeah. So subconsciously, then it, then it comes out. Hmm. And it's funny you should bring that, that aspect of it up too, you know, when you were younger, because that is the cultural teaching that, that Auntie Colossal went, offered to me around the drum, you know, the respect for the drum and how we, how we care for our drum and the respect that we have. Auntie Colossal Witt shared with me, we look after our drum the same way we look after a newborn baby. You wouldn't leave your newborn baby out, out on the porch in the rain and you wouldn't do that with your drum. And if your baby did get wet and cold, you wouldn't put it in the oven or on the fireplace mantle to dry it out and warm it up. It's the same thing with a drum. And the respect for the drum comes from the fact that two different things have given up their lives so that we could have this drum. You know, a tree give up its life for the, the frame that's made of wood. Yes. And a four-legged animal or, or a swimmer gave up its life for the skin on the drum. But those two things, lives, have, they're not really done here yet. They only retake the form of, of a drum. And, and they they've, can live they've on sacrificed their, their, their living being and their time here to walk in the field and eat grass or to be a standing living tree so that we could have a drum. They've given up the ability to look after themselves. So we become their caretaker and we take care of them the same way we would take care of a newborn baby. Okay, well, I appreciate that, George. Um, we've gotten to the end of our time, so I just want to thank you again. We have a little bit of a story. It was about a year ago. We happened to meet in the parking lot at Duke Point and just sort of struck up a conversation. So over a period of time, um, it's developed into a bit more of a relationship, but I certainly appreciate you coming down here and showing us some of your work and your skill and sharing your story with us. And I, I thank you for inviting me, Brian. I, I really hope this is just the beginning of a long friendship. Okay, well, I'll be up in Campbell River this summer, so. Come and eat some clam soup with me. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brian.